Hello, today is February 16, 2016. I'm meeting today with Mr. John Perrine at his home outside Berthoud, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, John, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. You're welcome. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born October 31st. 1947 in Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, went to school in Middlesex, New Jersey, um, through, through the 10th grade, and then we moved to another town, Dunellen. Do you, oh, I'm going to spell that for you, you know. Um, let's see, uh, did not graduate from there, was drafted. Later on, after I had quit school and uh, went into the Army, in, in, uh, I was drafted in December of 1966 and then uh, went into the Army. And what were you thinking What were you, when, you, when you got that draft notice? I mean, it, Vietnam was just starting to fire up, I think, in 66. It, it was right in the middle of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, What's this, uh, this 16, well, 17, 18 year old kid thinking when he gets his draft notice? Previous to being drafted, I tried to join the Marine Corps, but I didn't have a high school diploma, so that didn't work. So I went across the hall to the Navy recruiter and again, didn't have a high school diploma, but I was good. In, I was far enough advanced in education to go into the Army as a draftee. <laughs> and that's how I got in there. How much longer after you got your notice than did you head off for basic training? Uh, about two weeks. Yeah, wow. A little quick, a quick turnaround. Yeah, it was yeah. very fast. Yeah. Where did you go then for, for basic training? Well, I first went into Fort Dix, New Jersey. We stayed there about a week. And then I was shipped to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Oh, that had to be kind of a, a difference between a uh, Jersey boy going to the, the deep exactly. south. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we did... Uh, there was the uh, Green Berets and the Ranger oh. training was there. So I thought that's where I'd end up in one of those outfits. However, when the orders came down after basic training, I was sent to Virginia for uh, boat training. Believe it or not, Army has lots of boats. How, did, uh, how was that transition for you going from civilian life and uh, into civil or the military life? Actually, my father had been in the Army and uh, I was actually kind of looking forward to oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I tried, like I said, tried to yeah. join the Marines. But, um, and I thought the Marines would take anybody, but <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> but no, it was uh, it was good. You know, it's uh, just that you learn a lot more discipline and that kind of a thing and how to make your bed in the morning and make sure your clothes and everything are pretty neat. And they're, they're pretty tough on that part of it, mm. but... Uh, you learn. Yeah. So then, okay, so basic training, you get through basic training, you get sent off to the boats. How'd you get into that? Something you, uh, you tested for, asked for, I mean, or you just, were just assigned to? Aptitude test. Uh, after the aptitude test, that's where they sent me. Uh, I don't know why they picked me. I was a plumber before I went in the service, so um, I, that must have had something to do with it. I, I don't know why they picked me for that, but uh, it was... Uh, Pretty pretty interesting. I hmm. never thought I'd end up on a boat like that. Well, uh, take us now. Take your story from there. T talk about that training in the boats. And oh, uh, we trained down at uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, on the James River, and uh, as we started to go uh, out into the main river, and each guy got the feel of the boat and how it drove and and what have you. And we go around the old mothball fleets that were out there. There was hundreds of ships anchored out there from World War II, and they're still there as huh. far as I know. But, um, yeah, they're all just big piles of rust. But we got to go out there and climb up cargo nets and that kind of thing over the side, like you see in the World War II-type movies, where they all go over the side of the net. And when we got to actually do that out on the ocean, where the boats are bobbing up and down, oh, and right, the ships yeah. are bobbing up and down. So, yeah, it was, it was something I didn't... I, kind of didn't really expect, but yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. Now, were you trained for anything in, in particular with the boats? Yeah, or? I was the skipper of the boat. Oh, the, okay. Uh, 
the coxswain, the coxswain, mm -hmm. but, and uh, that's, you know, I learned how to drive and some navigational skills and those kinds of things, and how to, uh, how to handle the boats in rougher waters and those kinds of things. Uh, that was like 11 weeks of training. Oh, wow. It was kind of intense. You know, you had to learn how to read maps, you know, uh, charts in, right. the, in the military. Um, and those kinds of things. And harbor-type rules of when, where, and how you can come in and out of the harbor. What buoys to look for and those kinds of things. Even though when you're in Vietnam, you don't. There's no buoys. <laughs> it was all by... Well, I guess you, you never you never think of the army with boats. It, it seems like more, but obviously a navy. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't even know the army had boats. Yeah, yeah. And but they have lots of them. Huh. Like, yeah. Not a lot of them. Uh, Fort Eustis is a training center for boats and trains and helicopters and all kinds of those types of things. There's, believe it or not, the army controls and runs a lot of trains. I didn't know that hmm. until I was in there. <laughs> But then uh, we actually got to uh, do some tugboat work, smaller tugboats, and that was pretty interesting. Learn how to tie onto barges, which is my, one of my main jobs was hauling barges up and down the canals and rivers in Vietnam. So uh, I learned a lot hauling, hauling barges, I'll tell you that. Uh, of course, they're like very slow and like sitting ducks out there, but <laughs> it... Uh, yeah, you learn a lot of tricks of the trade, so to speak. But, uh, yeah, that's what I learned there. So you finished up uh, training there? and uh, what? Uh... Well, we finished training there, and we were in what they call garrison, where you're sitting, waiting to go somewhere. So I got the bright idea. I would just volunteer to go. And I went down to the personnel office and did that, and sure and heck, they'd let me. So you were going individually. You uh, you guys weren't assigned to, to cruise at that? Uh... Not at that point. Okay. But as I uh, did the volunteer thing and went there, about a month later after I got there, all the guys I was stationed with back in Virginia showed up in the company. Is that right? Uh? They, they came through in what they called levy, and they levied them out. And a lot of them came to my unit. But I'd already been there a month. So... It was, it was good to see the old guys and the old friends, you know, and stuff, but, uh, which I still keep in contact with today, but uh, it was uh, it was a surprise. I didn't think they'd be showing up, and here they came. <laughs> now, did that change uh, your status and compared to them as far as you volunteering and them? No. Uh, oh, okay. No. So there's no... Uh... A lot of them were draftees also. So oh, okay. It really didn't make any difference. I didn't know if they cut, no. cut your uh, tour shorter or no. give you any no, special no, privileges. Actually, a lot of those guys who came after me got out before really? me. Really? Oh, jeez. So, uh, no, it, it really didn't change anything that oh, okay. way. Okay. Uh, but um, from from Fort Eustis, Virginia, to uh, I ended up in Cameron Bay, which was real short lived, like a day. So uh, I was. I, I'm thinking you flew over, or you take. Uh, How would you guys get over? Uh, yeah, we flew from um, Seattle, Washington, to Japan, to Cameron Bay, and from Cameron Bay, I went to uh, the Bin Long Replacement Center, which sent me down to a place called Bung Tao, and the next day we got on a boat and went up the Mekong River to the to the unit, which was up the river, maybe 20 miles or so, but it was uh, just a outpost dredged out of the main river, and they pumped all the sand and mud in there and made a made a base camp. How, how was that? Uh, do you remember that, that flight uh, over particularly probably the, the Japan to, to Vietnam segment? I mean, you're you're really kind of flying into the unknown. I mean, yeah, you, you, it, what, what's, do you remember uh, what was going through your mind? What uh, the? There's some apprehension, you know, yeah. what kind of a unit are they going to put me in? Are we going to see a lot of action or that kind of a thing? You just don't know. So. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, it was just unknown, and you yeah. get a little anticipation, yeah. but I, I wasn't too worried about where I'd go. But 
I didn't know they're gonna send me to one of the hottest spots in the country. Well, that you know, that's another thing. I was here when I interviewed a Vietnam veteran. It was when they first opened that plane door and you step out to talk. Well, I thought we'd be like running out of a out of a landing craft on the beach with guns blazing. But it was, uh, Cameron Bay was a pretty secure place. It was like you know the war wasn't going on for them. It seemed. But I heard when they first opened the door, it's almost, I don't know what time of year you landed, but it was almost like walking into a steam bath when you oh, departed, very hot. The, departed no the plane. Oh, yeah. it was real hot. And the smells and, and the... And, and there's certain smells there that trigger your memory. Yeah. Diesel fuel and sand is, or two mixed together, and that's one thing that you, you'll never forget that smell. Every once in a while, I'll smell something with diesel fuel and dirt mixed together, and I go, well, this is just like it was. Uh, wow. You, know, you never seem to forget that. Yeah, yeah. It's, so you got down to that outpost, and that's where you got into your crew then? or right. Were you guys in a crew when you flew over, or were you still no, a replacement? I, I, we were replacing guys that were coming back. So this was uh, January of 1968. Oh, boy. And we knew the Tet Offensive was coming. I didn't realize it would be so intense, but it was. And so uh, we went from uh, a beach resort town called Vung Tao, uh -huh. which we always jokingly referred that's where the VC take their R&R. &R. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we went upriver, got into our uh, base camp at Dong Tam, and Dong Tam was a on the tidal river it was a uh, a basin it was a harbor is, the, is this down in the delta in the delta okay and uh my very first day in the company the supply sergeant was from my hometown really so he gave me all new equipment no he didn't give he didn't give me all the old junk he gave me all new stuff <laughs> which i thought was kind of neat yeah and that night we got hit and I was blown up in a bunker with a rocket, and that was my first day. Oh, <laughs> that a company. trial by fire. Oh, man. That was my first day there, which I uh, consequently lost my hearing, and uh, I still pay for that to this day. Oh, boy. With a couple of hearing aids and what have you. But, yeah, that was my introduction to the Mobile Riverine Force, which I was in. And that's... Just the way it was. Wow, wow. <laughs> I went, I volunteered for this <laughs> dummy. <laughs> or just a stupid thing, but eh, we all had it to do. I just wanted to do it quicker than the rest of them. <laughs> right, right, right. So that was your base camp through the through the entire... Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't spend a lot of time in the base camp. Right. Uh, we were a floating unit. There were 22 boats, I believe, in that unit. And uh, we would go on what was called the mission. We might not come back for three months. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And uh, we ate mostly sea rations because there was nothing else out there to eat, except once in a while they'd fly in some hot food for us uh, on a chopper. We had one particular flat top barge that we could land a helicopter on. We'd push that with us to evacuate wounded or to bring in like hot food and that kind of a thing. And you just lived on the boat then? Or? Yeah, we just lived on the boat. There was a six-man crew. Um, some, uh, most of the crew were guys I was stationed with back at uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia. I had a, a, a engine mechanic, and uh, the rest were crewmen. They would, like if we tied up, they'd you know tie the rope and what have you. I'd steer the boat into wherever, and uh, had to, uh, you know, maintain the boat and that kind of thing. Those guys did that. I just mainly just drove the boat, and I would either haul barges with 105 howitzers on them. Uh, barges would have two 105 howitzers, uh, and when we moved up canals and rivers, we'd load them with beehive rounds and leveled them out to the to the banks so if we did get hit we just blow them up so Which you happened. so you weren't actually hauling uh uh 
equipment side. You were you were yeah, hauling the guns to the, protect uh, protect the uh, part of the artillery the unit. Okay. And uh, we had probably six boats that hauled the barges with the 105s on them. Then a couple of them would haul fuel. Some would haul because we had to refuel out there on the mission, and uh, we also uh, would haul ammunition for all this, so we'd load up back in the base camp with ammunition and then bring it out, and sometimes I did, had to do that, and sometimes I hauled special assignments like uh, hauling barges loaded with gravel for the engineering company building a road somewhere, I'd have to pick them up some river or canal and drop those off so they could get the materials they needed. And sometimes I would pick up uh, troops that are out in the field and they'd coordinate by radio and different colors of smoke, grenades. Uh, they might say, uh, I'm going to be popping purple smoke. Well, then I know it was safe. And they were the right guys going to pick up. And sometimes as they loaded up, we'd get hit. But and sometimes not. Sometimes it was they knew we were leaving, didn't want to hit us anyway, so we were going. So, but at any rate, yeah, I'd pick them up or what, whatever it might be. I have very few pictures of of Vietnam, but uh, mainly because I lost them all in the big Thompson flood in 1976. Oh. But I do have some that other people have sent me. Yeah. So. Uh, that's about all I have of that, except some memories. Right. Well, you know, I, I as I've interviewed you know, these various river rats, to me it seems like you guys were like uh, the shooting gallery at, at a carnival, just going up and down. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what it was like going up these these rivers and these canals. And some of them were very very close, like you could touch the vegetation on the sides. Oh, jeez. So some of them were really hard to turn around. You had to do like a K-turn in a car, you know, to get her yeah. you know, wider than the road out there. So you'd have to kind of get turned around. But, uh, yeah, and I, you, you were often really, really close. And, you know, but we, we had 50 caliber machine guns on the boat, one on each side, an M60 machine gun, an M79 grenade launcher, and then everybody had their personal weapons, so... If we were to get hit or something, I'd be driving the boat and I'd shoot the M79 grenade launcher out the side of wherever we're getting hit from. But, uh, that happened quite a few times, uh, especially during the Tet Offensive when it was real hot and heavy. Yeah, talk about that, uh, that, uh, that well, time. The Tet Offensive is uh, the Vietnamese New Year's and it starts in January and... Uh, they geared up to attack us on every opportunity. Uh, in the base camp, there was a mortar attack every day or every night for months. It was going to happen every day. You just knew. You just didn't know when. <clears throat> now, on, out on the out on the river, it was uh, the uh, the ground troops of the Ninth Infantry Division would go in and stir up trouble and then we would shoot our artillery back sometimes very close so, um, but uh, that's what we were doing was supporting the, those troops that were on the ground right sometimes right in front of us I mean you could see the guys actually walking through the rice paddies and what have you <clears throat> sometimes we had to shoot the 105 howitzers almost straight near so they'd come down close you can't lob them, you know, so that kind of a thing. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, we saw, we had uh, different kinds of boats with us. Some of the Navy, it was the Army and the Navy working directly together. We have what was called Zippo boats, which had a big flamethrower on the front. And uh, sometimes when we get up smaller canals and things that hell would break loose, we'd shoot the, the flamethrower. <laughs> And oh, that must have been a sight. Oh, quite quite a sight. Oh. I used to have a lot of pictures of them, but like I said, I've lost most. But yeah, it was uh, it was exciting at the time. I'll say that mm. very much so. 
Well, how, how, I'm trying to comprehend what it was like. I mean, in previous wars, World War II, Korean War, you knew that five or six clicks up the road, that was the front line, but there was really no front line where you no, guys, it was how did you, scattered everywhere. how could you ever, I don't know how you could ever let your, your guard down. Uh, well, you couldn't really, you had to kind of stay on your toes because you would end up a casualty. But uh, most everybody that wasn't in some kind of a military uniform, being the South Vietnamese Army, South Vietnamese Marines, the Koreans and the Australians were all with us. We knew what they looked like. Right. But anybody else with a gun in their hand was generally the enemy. And uh, Well, even even those without the gun, I mean, going, oh, you know, was, you, you never could tell friend or foe, I wouldn't you, think. Uh, we often said that it was... They were farmers by day and fighters by night mm, yeah. because they would hit you mostly at night, sometimes during the days, but not quite as often as at night because they had darkness for concealment, and that's when they generally would hit us. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it pretty hard. Mainly, mainly you knew they were the enemy when you saw the tracers coming at you. <laughs> then you, you know it wasn't us. <laughs> See, our tracers were all red. Theirs were white or a greenish color. So if you saw a white or green, greenish colored tracer, it was generally the enemy. And sometimes on the river, right around the bend, they were pretty close. Mm -hmm. So we saw all these tracers coming. It was time to open up. Wow, man. Were you protected in the, in the wheelhouse? Or well, it had a, as you can see in a picture like this, it's, uh, that's what the wheelhouse kind of looked like. But uh, we had several guys in my position that were wounded in there. You know, that round would land in there and bounce around and get somebody. I tried not to let that happen. Oh, man. Uh, <clears throat> and, and how was it, as I look uh, over your situation, you know, you're in, in extremely hot climates mm -hmm. or, or the rainy season. Oh, it's uh, or rain. Uh, you weren't. Probably, I imagine, getting enough sleep. The food was probably fair to Midland. Hygiene probably wasn't so great. I mean, any one of those things, I think, would, would knock a man down. But then you had, you know, you, then you had the umbrella of war on top of that. How do you think you made it through that period of time? Um, alcohol. <laughs> as much as we could get. <laughs> but uh, generally, it's, it's a... Uh, you go into survival mode most of the time, so you you always keep your eyes peeled, and you uh, uh, and we always had sentries on duty. Nobody, everybody didn't sleep at once. Right. We'd have somebody, you know, out there with a with a machine gun or something to uh, keep an eye on things. But uh, you knew it was going to happen, so you just had to be prepared. Wow. Would you get, uh, how often would you get pulled back for R&R, &R, whether it was uh, in-country or did you get, and talk about any out-country, uh, uh, the r and that you got if you got one? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, once in a while, we'd go back to our base camp, and at the base camp, we could uh, get haircuts. They had a club that you could go up there and guzzle as much beer as you could, and uh, the, and to walk into a club with a machine gun over your shoulder and, and you have to go hanging on the wall so you didn't get drunk and shoot any of your buddies. But uh, it just felt weird to walk in there with guns all loaded and because uh, you never knew. But <clears throat> those were a break, <clears throat> do some repairs, that kind of a thing. Um, the R&R uh, &R that I got, I went to, I tried to go to Australia, but that, I wasn't high ranking enough to get on the plane and mm. it was filled up pretty quickly. So I went to Taiwan. <clears throat> I wanted to go someplace where they had round eyed girls rather than slam. Yeah, right, girls, sure. Yeah. That didn't happen. But uh, Taiwan was a beautiful country and they treated us very well because we had a Navy base there anyways at the time. But they didn't want you to go out on the street in your uniform. They wanted you to be in civilian clothes. And when we got there, all my civilian clothes ended up in Hawaii. Oh. So I had to have my friend Shorty 
go out and buy me a pair of pants and a shirt so I could, so I had to stay in the R&R &R center until he got back with some clothes. But then we just, you know, it was a one week long party. But, but, and I turned 21 on October 31st, uh, 1968. And uh, so they, it ha just so happens that my birthday and Chiang Kai-shek's birthday are the same day. So they thought that was a big deal. They wouldn't, they were very money hungry people, you know, for income, but I couldn't buy a drink or anything because huh. of the fact that it would happen to be yeah. Chiang Kai-shek's birthday too. So they thought that was a very big deal. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they brought me a birthday cake and everything. It was quite the, quite the deal at the Bel Air Hotel in Taipei. <laughs> was, was that tough go, coming back from that r and R? I I mean, you were in civilization for a week. Yeah. Now you had to go, now you had to go back to... It's kind of a shock, but you already knew what you were looking at. And it was towards the end of my tour. Oh, okay. I was going to be leaving in a couple of months. Oh, okay. So... It wasn't quite as bad, but it sure was fun. <laughs> huh. Tell him about the first day you were there. I would do. In the bunker. I told him. Um, you, you were in the bunker. Yeah, I told him that. Yeah. Told him yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, on one particular mission, we went up a side canal off the main river, and we always moved at night, for obvious reasons, but with no lights. You, you can imagine 22 boats, 73 feet long, going up some canal with no, the only light they had was a sea ration can about that big around with a little red light in there. Now, if the light disappeared, you knew they were turning. Huh. But if they were stopping, you didn't know that. It was very easy to run into the boat in front of you. <clears throat> well, we ran aground on a mud flat out there. <clears throat> Couldn't get off. So uh, we ended up spending the night out there while the rest of the company went up river, except for the captain. He stayed down in his boat around us. And they lobbed rounds at us all night long and never hit us. They'd land next to the boat. They'd land past the boat, but they never hit us. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and in the morning, when the sun came up, the captain could get in close enough and the tide was coming in. They could get a rope on us and pull us off of there and then uh, get us back in the main river and then we went on with the mission. But yeah, they lobbed rounds at us all night. I can't, I, I can't imagine oh, having to put up with that all night. Like, yeah, oh, wondering if that next one, uh, it's here, here. Yeah, next you urinate quite often. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a tough night. It really was. But uh, it, uh, it was scary, but they were so bad shots. Huh. Or which I was thankful for because they never did hit us, but they sure tried. <sighs> they, they just couldn't do it. <laughs> huh. Wow. And how were towards the end of your tour there? They always say that's the worst part. Uh, yeah. As, as you're counting down and. Uh, um, yeah, I think the last four weeks I was there, I was the captain's. I mean, the first sergeant's uh, jeep driver. They made me that. So they got yeah. you off the river? They took me off the river and made me his jeep driver, which my main job was to keep him out of trouble with the brass. Because <laughs> <laughs> he would go over to the Navy Club with all his old cronies over there and drink all day long, and I had to kind of cover for him, and then go get him when the captain wanted him in a hurry. <laughs> so the last, last month was kind of fun, but it was also we were getting hit in the base camp every day. Yeah, uh, not a good thing because they lob in a bunch of rounds during the day. They were getting more and more <coughs> brazen and would shoot at us during the day. And uh, one particular day, I got tired of taking a shower at night because they uh, they kept lobbing rounds. And sure and heck, I was in the shower and they hit it and blew up right at the curb and the shower is right up against the curb. There was a truck there, and it hit the truck on the hood and blew the engine out of it. And I ran across the street to the bunker with not a stitch on. <laughs> and the next round landed right outside the bunker and blew dirt and me and everything back into the bunker. And I had a guy I'm kind of shivering, shivering there, and, and even as hot as it was, I was shivering. 
and uh, he handed me a towel and I felt like a suit of armor <laughs> having a towel on you know but uh, that was short lived but I, I got smart after that and I will show you how I decided that I build my own shower huh. so I got a 55 gallon drum and I went up to the officer's shower with a pipe wrench took that shower head and piping off of it <laughs> And came down and put that on the roof of the boat, and uh, got a uh, immersion heater that the military uses to heat water, and they and put that in there. And I had a hot shower. <laughs> I charged those guys a six pack <laughs> to take a shower, and they had to refill the tank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made out like a bandit on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is actually me at the shower. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to get that in here in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, speaking of showers, talk about the rainy season, what that was like. Um, you got up, you were wet. You went to bed, you were wet. You got up, and you're still wet. <laughs> Even the clothes you put on are damp because there's so much moisture in the air. And it rained. I mean, it rained hard there. And during the monsoon season, it just really dumped. <clears throat> One of the things that kept morale going is I got this little dog right there. Huh from uh, Vietnamese kids. They said they were going to eat him. I gave him five bucks for him. And we called him Lifer. <laughs> and uh, we had him on the boat. Everybody knew him. And uh, they all come over to pet him and everything because we didn't have very many pets. Over yeah, there. right. But uh, Lifer was good and he got distemper and passed away on me. But So I... I got a mongoose from one of our kids, and I had him in the hooch. He'd run around there. He, he was really cool. He was a lot of fun. But those kinds of things, and I had, we also had on there at one point a monkey named Gertrude. And the monkey was a lot of fun, but she shred everything she could get a hold of, you know, paper-wise. Come in here, be knee-deep in confetti. <laughs> but, you know, these were morale things, and, and they kept all the guys going. Right, and right. Everybody loved to pet the dog and mess with the mongoose and, and, or the monkey. But uh, what, what would you guys do when you're, uh, particularly when you're back on base and, and weren't on duty for entertainment? Uh, sounds um, like it, obviously a drink. And, not and much. We did have a, Ann Margaret came to oh, really, for huh? the... Uh, for the Bob Hope Christmas show, mm -hmm. I was getting ready to go home at the time, and uh, we had an island out in the river about a mile wide and three miles long called BC Island, and as she was coming in, they flew her in, uh, we got hit, so they sent a B-52 bomber strike over there and just bombed the heck out of that island. To the virtually shake the ground. Wow, wow. I, if you've been that close to a, you know, within a half a mile of a B 52 bomber strike, you wouldn't believe the, how intense it is. And it's, I mean, it virtually shake the ground. Wow. After that, she was in the bunker that they made for a stage, and she was underneath there. She came back out, did the whole show, and uh, she, was, she was a lady hero. Uh, my book. Wow, wow. Love her to pieces. Yeah. And uh, that, that was a real morale booster. Right. Well, speaking of morale, uh, talk about another thing that was different in your war was uh, the strife back home. W were you guys aware of that? And, and how did it play on morale in country? It was, you know, there's a lot of guys that plain didn't want to be there. Right. Understandable. <clears throat> um, I wasn't one of those. I thought we were doing the noble thing, but uh, they, uh, a lot of, some of them grind and some of them had peace signs and what have you, and peace necklace, you know, and that kind of a thing. But uh, uh, we knew what was going on back there. We heard about it and all, but most of us hated them hippies, and, <laughs> and we called them, called them all hippies, them damn hippies, but uh, we hated them. But, and coming home to that wasn't a lot right. of music. Yeah, right. Yeah. Knowing that, you know, I kind of expressed that the brass band parade, but that didn't happen. No, yeah. It was more booze and baby killer and what have you. It was kind of hard to just swallow that your own people were, you know, 
not supporting me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was kind of hard. Yeah. Well, uh, prior to that, talk about um, the day you left country and what that was like and the feeling and when you finally I got I left any... there December 31st, 1968 and flew to uh, Long Bend Replacement Center on the other way. That was on the 30th. And the 30th, that place had never been hit until the 30th when I was there. <laughs> got hit. We no longer had any rifles or helmets or flak jackets. We were going home tomorrow. So we went in the building, in the barracks, and pulled all the mattresses down on top of us. And they blew a hole right in that barracks. Oh, <laughs> but that ended fairly quickly. It was only about 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long. But they lobbed a bunch of mortar around and it was a little scary. I said, well, I can go tomorrow and I'm leaving. I hope I don't get killed today. Oh. But uh, the next day we got to Tonsnut Air Base there and got on the Freedom Bird, as it was called, and uh, which is a Braniff airline. I remember mm -hmm. the Braniff airline because they had st real stewardesses with short dresses on. <laughs> 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 so they said you couldn't take any booze or anything like that on the airplane, no hand grenades, and they'd search all your stuff, and they'd have a barrel outside these two tents. The first barrel, throw all your weapons and hand grenades or whatever in here. Then you went out of that door and there, into another tent, had another barrel there. This is your last chance. <laughs> throw any hand grenade, blah, 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 <laughs> pot, whatever, in this barrel. From beyond this point, then you're in trouble. Well, I had two bottles of champagne in my little bag, and I managed to slip that through there. <laughs> <laughs> and we got on the plane and got up in the air, and it's New Year's Eve. So, uh, no booze, blah, 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 and they're walking up down the aisle, and I got that bottle out and popped the cork, bounced all the way down the airplane, and I handed it all my guys. Everybody got like a little sip out of it, and that was it. And then uh, I had one bottle left, and when we got into uh, Oakland Army Center, it was New Year's Day. No, it was New Year's Eve again. Right. So we got, and we drank that one in the men's room, a bunch of guys, you know. But uh, that was kind of fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> At that point, we didn't much care. <laughs> what, what was that like? Uh, I, I always do a comparison with the previous wars. I mean, in the previous wars, you know, they took chips home and it took them six to six weeks to get home. I mean, literally, 24 hours later, you know, you're out of a war zone back in America. Right, it was kind of a shock. You yeah. know, certain noises that you were used to and detected associated with mortar rounds or what have you would make you jump. Make you jump on the ground. Everybody'd look at you like you're crazy. 24 hours ago, you were, right. you were in it. Right. So... Yeah, it was kind of a hard adjustment there. Didn't take long to get adjusted, but it, it did. And was it similar there when you got landed in Oakland that you had to switch to civilian clothes or? Uh, no, they re-outfitted us with new uniforms and everything. Even though you're getting out the next day, uh, they wanted you to be properly in uniform, what have you. And then as soon as you got to a hotel, you're changing the civilian clothes. Which is about as quick as you could. Right, right, you know, right. That. So you were discharged there in Oakland, then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, J January the first. Wow. So yeah, I'm done then. And uh, take your story from there then. Uh, so, took me a couple of days to get home to uh, party in a little bit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally got on the plane and went home and got to Newark, New Jersey, and took a cab from Newark to my town, which is, I don't know, 15 miles away or so. And I had them drop me off by the high school so I could walk from the high school to the house, which is only two blocks. And uh, walked down there and, you know, of course, mom was there and it was New Year's. So my mother and dad were there and um, my brother and, and two, two sisters were there. Um, and it was, you know, the whole, they were happy to see me, but that's about the only ones I thought were happy. 
Huh. You know, it was kind wow. of sad in that way. I didn't, of course, I had to get ridiculed for, why didn't you tell us when you were coming? Oh, they did? They weren't where you were coming? Oh, jeez. No, they didn't. But it was so doggone cold. It was 17 degrees out. It felt like 30 below zero. Yeah, I'm sure. After My hands virtually yeah. turned blue walking that one, two blocks. Yeah, after a year in the tropics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you were there yesterday, so. Yeah. It, uh, it was a little weird. <laughs> uh. But starting to get readjusted. Yeah, and how was that, in relation to my earlier question, how was that adjustment going from military life, and particularly after what you'd been through, back to civilian life? Well, it was kind of hard at first knowing you left some good friends there. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. And my intention was to stay there, but my my time was up in the military altogether. I, oh, okay. I mean, I was within a couple of days of when I went in, and... They said you could stay, but you'd have to re-enlist for a couple of years. And I said, I just want to stay another six months for a bunch of my buddies would be leaving too. Yeah. And they said, you can't do that unless you re-enlist. And I said, well, see you later. And yeah. that was the end of that. Right, <laughs> right. Did, did your, your, your folks or your, your brothers or sisters ever talk about, did, did they see a, a, a different John that left to the one that came back? Could they... Did they, um, I mean, was that even a, a discussion at any time through yeah. the years? That uh... Yeah, you know, uh, in the military, you learn respect for older people, uh, or anybody older than you. Call them yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and yeah. all that kind of thing, which was not me when I went in there. Right, <laughs> right. It was me when I got out. Right. But, yeah, it was uh, definitely a different, uh, a different me coming back, you know, and I mean, you see, kill people and see people getting killed. Right. Changes your whole outlook on life. Sure. So it was it was definitely an adjustment, you know, that uh, uh, some didn't do so well. And I was just fortunate that I wasn't as crazy as the rest of them for some reason. Not that I didn't have my moments. I had plenty of those. And nightmares and things like that. Yeah, I had plenty of that, as Gene can attest to. I had a few nightmares. I didn't mean a strangler. <laughs> Not in the night. <laughs> but she she lived with it, and it's pretty amazing. So take, take your story. You're back home now in New Jersey, uh, out of the Army. Take the story from there. Oh, kind of. I, I got a job right away. Back in the plumbing business? No, I yeah. went, actually I worked for the Burroughs Corporation that made uh, uh, computer parts. But I was in the mail room there. I worked in the mail room. Monkeyed around at that for a couple of months. And then after that, a girl I used to know ended up getting married to her, which did not last very long. Maybe two, not quite two years. Somewhere in there. But that didn't last. I was, I was not all there. So, For, uh, yeah. Does that tie into your war experience, or are you just young and yeah. immature, or what? Or you weren't all there. Well, what, what, wasn't uh, all there. It was a little bit of everything. Yeah. Okay. It was that okay. it was being young and inexperienced, and right. not knowing what I was doing, and uh, uh, I hadn't met her yet. So. Right. But it was right after that I met her, and uh, we were both married before. But when uh, we've been married now, forty-four years, <laughs> forty-four years, and it was the first marriage just wasn't. It was just on impulse or sure. some stupid thing. I don't know. Right. But it, it wasn't smart. But I did have one child with her, who's now forty-five, forty-six. Next week will be 46, so it's been quite a while. But, uh, and then we have two children when they're in their 40s. And how did you two meet? Tell, tell that story. Um, I, w I won't say my normal dumb thing. <laughs> I was like, I met her on visiting day at the prison. <laughs> I, I did. I actually, she was going with a friend of mine at the time, and they were, they were having some kind of a New Year's 
get together or something, and I met her at that party there. I didn't know much, and I immediately liked her. I was still taking the wrong path at the time. But the truth be known, he was pretty messed up from Vietnam. Yeah, right, yeah. right. He was very wild, didn't think things mattered because the war hadn't mattered. And when he came home, you know, people wanted to argue with him, why did you go there? Yeah, it was the wrong thing for them to do. Yeah. Yeah. And he would get into a lot of fights. Of, and, uh, yeah. Those days were all behind me. And right. I mean, since then, I've come to know Jesus and changed me a lot. good church right down the street here and um, we don't generally miss too many meetings too many Sundays I do actually right now <clears throat> I get, since I've been in law enforcement after I've gotten out I, I uh, um, do security for that church because you never know in this day and age so uh, I like to you know Humorously considered, I'm packing for Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a whole different outlook on life since since that time. Well, I, I imagine there, there was that gap between between coming home and, and, and finding Jesus where there... Well, I mean, we didn't know about PTSD or there was, I mean, no. you had, you had no help. I mean, never even you, heard of it for several years. I mean, people probably look at you, oh, you know, <clears throat> physically you're fine, you know, but, right. uh, but I did, uh, start hearing about it, but there were all the really severe cases of P PTSD, uh, guys who just, you knew were never going to get it together, no matter what you did or how you tried to help them or treat them. And when I first came home, a tremendous amount of hearing loss from the explosion that uh, I never got uh, any help from the VA. It's on record up there. Back in the 70s, I went up there first time. Never did help me out. And then I met a gal named Debbie who works there. And she told me, I met her on uh, Veterans Day at the VFW Club. Uh, Debbie Pearson. There. Excuse me? Debbie Pearson. Yeah, yeah, Debbie. Great lady. And she said, I'll help you out. You come up and see me. And so I took all my stuff and took it up there. And, and she got me 30% uh, disability and hearing aids for the rest of my life through that. But, but this is years later, right? Oh, That's, yeah. It was only a few years ago a few years that ago. I got oh. that taken care of. Um, but since it was combat related, they didn't even argue. They, uh, they, uh, they had it on record that we had uh, gone there several times, but had given up in 1974. Yeah, 74. We just yeah. kind of gave up on the VA and left there. Oh, <clears throat> if you told anyone that you had been in Vietnam, there wasn't PTSD, right. but if you told people you had been to Vietnam, they didn't want to have anything to do with you because they knew you were crazy. And we weren't all crazy, just some of us. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was disheartening. But Debbie Pearson did a marvelous job of helping me out. Um, and she's helped a couple of my friends, too. Because I sent them up there and they said, oh, I'm not going to get anywhere with this. I said, you go back there. I'll tell you what to do. How to do it. Go mm -hmm. see Debbie. And and they've gotten hearing aids and, and disabilities also. And my my own stepfather, Nick, I, he goes to the VA. All, I take him to the VA down in Denver every, oh, God, they've treated him for cancer. They've treated him for back injury and a bunch of stuff. So it, the VA is better than it was. It's not perfect yet, but... Uh, it's gonna get better, I think, it, with a new president. I think it'll be. Yeah. I think it'll be better. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But, but this you, president you, doesn't care about veterans right. at all. And <clears throat> that's since I have to tell the truth here. He's a lousy president. Yeah. He's the worst I've ever seen. Yeah. 
But, uh, you know, when we had hero presidents like Eisenhower and uh, John Kennedy, you know, those types of presidents have gone by the wayside. And now we elect a village idiot, but uh, I'm hoping this time we get somebody who's really good. Yeah, yeah. I really do. But uh, not only for the Vietnam veterans, but for the guys coming out of Afghanistan and Iraq and they paid a price too and they uh, they deserve the best treatment possible there's only about seven percent of the population that ever goes in the military well, it's less than that so it's like three percent yeah. i yeah. thought it was seven percent that were ever in but um at any rate three percent fought for the rights of the other you know uh, 96 97 percent so they deserve absolutely the treatment they do get yeah. it didn't come for nothing right you know you get That's that for free right. you, know? yeah. you didn't get that for free you right. paid for that in blood sweat and tears and uh, but i'm fiercely a loyal um patriot i fly my flag every day and uh, still the greatest country on earth without a doubt we just need good leadership yeah yeah how, how do you feel now that we've had, uh, from the time you were in Vietnam, and we, we've had a good 40 some odd years to, to analyze it, what are your thoughts of the war then through the years, and what, is it, what are your thoughts on it as you look back on it now and everything we've learned about it? Well, I would still do it again to this day. Would you, yeah? Yes, I absolutely would. When uh, they, when uh, Desert Storm was, uh, when 9 11 happened, mm -hmm. I tried to see if I could get back in there. Really? Yeah. When they said I was too old, I was 39. How old are you? No. But it's 2001. Okay, I was a little older. <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, um, they said, there's no way you're too old. I guess I was 43. And the cutoff was 39 or something. But they said 53. no. So uh, they said no way. But I, I would have done it again huh. in a heartbeat. But some people had a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think there's any nobler way to die than for your country anyways. And, uh, you know, all gave some, but some gave all. Right, yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the adjustments have been hard. Um, but I had a great woman behind me that um, showed me the error of my ways on more than one occasion. <laughs> but, uh, and I have great kids and, you know, they support, support me 100%. They're, uh, they throw a breakfast on uh, Veterans Day every year invite all my veteran and police and fire friends to that. We have on the average 30 to 35 people there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Every year. And we pay for that. And, yeah. But I want them to know that they're not forgot. Even by me, who happens to be one of them. Yeah. Um, and I'm still in the law enforcement thing, so, you know, I have a lot of friends in that. And so we invite them all. And we have a really great breakfast and you know it, it's it's nice yeah and memorial weekend and memorial weekend we have 200 200 and we've done it for 24 years this will be our 29th wow. well, i guess it was a little more than i thought but we and we pay for that uh, yeah. but every year it's the best money i ever spent yeah yeah but we feed them all it's a three-day event Sometimes we stretch it to four or something. Uh, it's, uh, we do a ceremony for all the police, fire, and veterans and active duty. And uh, we've given out a jacket to every person that showed up with um, our names and what have you on them, or vests, or whatever. We've given all kinds of things wow. over the years. But, 
it's just to know that uh, there's still people in this country who care about what you do. And, and uh, you know, the strife we're going through right now with killing cops is really, yeah. really makes me mad, but not much I can do about it right now. But just, you know, it's, you can't be doing that. Yeah, yeah. But very hard. Now, uh, you talk about getting together with, with local events and such. Through the years, have you kept in touch with the guys you served with? Any sort of reunions, anything like well, that? Well, never had. But they have the Mobile Riverine Force reunion in Indianapolis every year. But I have yet to get to it, even though I'd like to. Just never have made it. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I do keep in contact with about three of the guys that I served with over in Vietnam. One lives in West Virginia, and one lives in Northern Michigan, and one lives in Paramount, California. Oh, you spread out. Yeah, yeah, but I still know them all and still talk to them all. And, um, matter of fact, a friend of ours, I, I, him and I were in Fort Eustace before we ever went to Vietnam, he was married to a gal, and he <laughs> He's just now divorcing her after 50 years they've been together. I, said, I thought you'd have it figured out by now. <laughs> 50 years, and now all of a sudden he wants a divorce. He's a nut job. <laughs> huh. But, uh, yeah, it's a sad thing. And then my buddy Shorty, who lives in Paramount, California, who I went on R&R &R with, um, never got married. Just never never did. Hmm. Been a bachelor all his life. Hmm. And, and the one in West Virginia is just nuts. <laughs> he ain't just a nut job, but he, he's a great guy. I had a lot of fun with him uh, back here in the States. But, uh, yeah, he has unfortunately uh, got every disease known to man, I think. A lot of it may have... They used a lot of Agent Orange down there where I was, and a lot of big people were affected by that. Right. Even though they... They never seem to admit that. Right, right. We used a lot of it. So, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, some some guys didn't make out so good. And and how were you, in regards to Asian Orient and such, you talked about, obviously, the hearing loss. Yeah. Uh, any other physical uh, effects from... Uh, were you affected by Asian Orange that you're um, aware of? Or, uh... We were in contact with it a lot, especially because it ended up on the water. Yeah. So all the guys on the Navy boats and all the guys that are on the ships and all, all that water was, was taken into the intakes and what have you. And yeah, you get in contact with it. It hadn't affected me, but, you know, we washed our clothes in those rivers and then put them on. Uh, uh, the way you washed your clothes was you tied them all together on a line threw it overboard while you're going up river. And just like a wash machine, but in the prop wash. <clears throat> and then dry them out and put them on. Huh. And, you know, huh. had that Agent Orange all over them. Not to mention what else was in that room. Whatever yeah. else, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the hygiene over there wasn't the best. Right. So, yeah, you'd end up... Uh, and a couple of them ended up with malaria, but uh, I quit taking the malaria pills on the first one I took. And I said, these things make you go to the minimum more than you want. I never took them again. I never huh. got it. <laughs> huh. Wow. But, yeah, the mosquitoes went, ain't biting that guy. He's got Agent Orange. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, <clears throat> the Agent Orange thing is something that was a, one of the stupidest military moves we ever made. <clears throat> Defoliated jungle. <laughs> and stuff was growing back faster than you could kill it. It was the dumbest thing you ever heard of. Hmm. But that's the military for you. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, it, it's affected some people. I just happened to be one of the fortunate ones that didn't. Um, thank God. Yeah. I didn't want to have to deal with that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Any desire to ever go back and visit Vietnam? Um, yeah, I'd love to go see what it's like when we're not blown at the kingdom come. Yeah. But, uh, and my uh, brother, my home brother, is married to a Vietnamese gal. She's there right now. 
she's in a town called Tainin, which is pretty well known. Um, he, uh, but uh, yeah, I I would like to see it again, see what it looks like, and because it's a beautiful country, right? right? You're not, yeah. When all the trees aren't snapped off ten feet above the ground, oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> round and what have you, blowing it up for one reason or another. But yeah, I, I imagine it's really pretty. Uh, one of my Navy buddies lives in, who worked with me for thirty years. He uh, he's married to a Vietnamese gal, oh. and uh, yeah, I, I'd like to see it again. Um, just to see what it's like when we're not blowing it. Yeah, yeah. But it's a very pretty country. Mm. It's kind of like the Philippines or Hawaiian Islands, that kind of a, you know, tropical looking paradise type right. thing. Right, right. Uh, don't have the mountains like Hawaii has, except up north, but I don't know too much about that because I never was up there. Right. I always in the Delta. Right. Well, let's uh, jump forward to back into uh, post four years. So, what uh, you went into law enforcement for a career then? Oh, after? No, no. Huh. I ran. Uh, I was in always in either plumbing or construction of some kind, and then I had an opportunity to go with the city of Loveland, and I was laid off from U.S. Engineering up here. So I uh, took that, and I saw an opportunity at the water treatment plant. That's right. Yeah. And I worked there forty years. So I must have liked that. But he started on the trash truck. Yeah, I started on the garbage truck, moved to the water department, and then got a chance to go to the water treatment plant. And I was, like I said, I, I ran it for 40 years. I had some good people that worked for me, and they're still there, most of them. And, uh, but I got into law enforcement as a horse-mounted posse, not so much as a full-time cop. But... Uh, even though we're trained like them, we carry guns like they do, and, but we don't do a lot of the enforcing as much. Our job is more being seen, being PR people. Um, the sheriff loves us because he's got a contingent of about 25 people that he doesn't have to pay and still can leave the other deputies open for other work while we do the guarding and the roadblocks and the parades and what have you, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of the county fairs and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, that wasn't my full intention, but uh, even though that's what I wanted to do in the first place, when we were in California, I was going to Grossmont Junior College and majoring in criminology at the point. So you went, eventually went and got your GED then? If, oh yeah, I yeah. went and got a GED and went to night school for almost two years. That's how far behind I was. Graduated from there and then I went and took a GED test on top of that just to make sure that I, I had already had a high school diploma. But I, wanted, I wanted a GED also. So huh. I went and got that. And then I went to Grossmont and uh, did not graduate from there. I had an opportunity to move here and I wanted to do it and got laid off. Mm -hmm. So I came here, and then had applied for the highway patrol in California. Highway patrol, which I made it on their their waiting list, but uh, not until after he was out. But I already road. moved here. <laughs> oh, geez. And then I got a notice to go, and uh, I don't think I want to move back. So yeah. I didn't go. Yeah. So this was kind of a back door into law enforcement. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, and I was the captain of the posse for a couple of years and it gets kind of rotated out uh, but I enjoyed being the captain of it and, and we've got some awful good guys in there that are very dedicated for we don't get paid right, right. we don't get compensated but there's guys in there with 30 40 years in it hmm. I've been in it 17 years Wow. 17 or 18 years. Wow. You know, never got a dime for any of it, but I didn't expect it either. Yeah. I know, I knew going in it wasn't going to pay anything. But it's a good way to give back to the community and and that kind of a thing. But I, I put a, I, me and maybe one other guy in there put in probably the most hours per year since I've been in it. Uh -huh. I've either been number one or number two in hours. Wow. Um, 
The only one that ever really beat me was C.J. Fell, who uh, actually is a deputy out in Yuma County now, full-time deputy out there. But uh, between him and myself, we covered a lot of a lot of time. Uh, wow. We sit on crime scenes. We, you know, murders and what have you. I'd, I'd done every graveyard shift by myself at the county fair since it opened out there. Every one. Wow. Never missed a one. Wow. At the Budweiser. Yeah. At the Budweiser Event yeah. Center. Yeah. yeah. And I've done some at the old fairgrounds, but out there I'd never missed a one. Wow. I'd just take my trailer out there and live there for the duration of the county fair. Wow. And I do the graveyard shifts because I'm not afraid of the dark. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, and I catch some boogers now and then, but you know, you won't find those anywhere. A lot of people congregate. There's got to be somebody who's willing to take it away from you. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we do that. Hmm. So yeah, being in law enforcement. Matter of fact, at the VA club here in Loveland, I have there's a picture of me on the wall with I don't know maybe eight or ten other guys that have what they called served twice. Served in the military and then served in law enforcement. And there's about it's 10 right on the wall as you come in, right? Yeah, on the right. Yeah, yeah, I'm in yeah. there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. and another guy who did a very similar job to me is I don't know if you ever talked to John Chevalier. I know, I know who he, he is. is. I've never sat down. He with him. was on a Navy boat, but he was north of me, in a different river, and. Uh, but he did the same kind of thing as me, except he was on the Navy. But right, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. there's a couple of us around. There's a, Kevin. There's one or two other guys that I really don't know very well that were in that same kind of thing. <clears throat> but it was a unique unit. Matter of fact, the captain of my company was named Gus Pagonis, a little Greek fella. One of the most fearless and toughest guys I ever met in my okay. life. He ended up a three-star general. Oh, wow. He sent me a picture. I get, Gene's going to get the picture for you. Uh, when he got his first or second star, he sent me a picture and says, John, thanks for your support in the early days. He was only a captain then and uh, ended up a three-star general. And my brother-in-law was under his command down here at Fort Carson. And... My brother-in-law at the time was a captain or a major, and he says, uh, my brother-in-law was in your outfit in Vietnam. He says, well, who was that? And he told him, and he says, well, you tell him to get down here and see me. And I went down to his office. Oh, wow. Uh, and his office was covered with pictures and stuff from our unit in Vietnam. And he didn't have anything else on the wall, just that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was glad to see that he made it because they used to call me either Mr. Lucky or just plain Jersey. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, the, that's him right there with okay. his first star. He's pretty, quite the character. He was, he was airborne infantry, uh, but his main job was... Um, logistics. Uh, was logistics. Oh. He was in charge of all the logistics, moved to Saudi Arabia for Desert Storm. When they went into that war, they were so prepared. It was unbelievable. All the tanks, all the jeeps, oh, right, yeah. all the fighting equipment, all the food, all the water was there. All I had to do was pick it up and go. And he was in charge of all that. Wow. But this it happens to be a piece of a Scud missile. Huh. <laughs> My brother-in-law sent it to me from Saudi. He was over there. He sent me this chunk of <laughs> Scud missile in uh, 91. Yeah, Iraqi Scud. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. He knew I'd get a kick out of it, so yeah. he sent it to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we start to wind down the interview, talk a little bit about family. Family. We have uh, Gene and myself, <clears throat> who've been married uh, 44 years. And we have uh, a son named John, who's 46 next, next week. Uh, that from a first marriage. Mm -hmm. And then I have... Two daughters, Deanna, which you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Tracy. I don't know if you know Tracy or not, but uh, she works at the Chelsea Center. Mm -hmm. They were born in 72 and 74. 72 and 74. 
And uh, I have a sister who lives right here in this other house. Um, one sister has passed away. I have a brother that lives in Pennsylvania. And another sister lives in Utah. So, uh, but that's all we have. My mother's passed away. My stepfather, Nick, lives right down the street, two miles away. And uh, he's a Korean War veteran. And uh, I take him to the VA all the time. Everybody says, oh, which one of you is the father? <laughs> it's hard to tell. He looks younger than I am. Uh, and he's a great guy, a stepfather to be proud of. He, yeah. He's quite a guy and a, and a great man. But he's still there. But my mom has passed away about four, four years now. Four years, she was 84. 84. And she passed away. But uh, my stepdad, he's, like I say, right up the street. We, and we see him quite often. I, we were there today. But I take him wherever he needs to go, and <clears throat> he's getting older, and I don't trust him driving to Denver by himself. Not that he would get lost or anything, but um, I just feel better knowing he's, I'm driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have two son-in-laws in law enforcement. Yeah, two son-in-laws in law enforcement. One is uh, Wesley Newby, who's a deputy in the jail. And then my other son-in-law is a cop and a loved one, Dave Sloat. Mar they're married to, uh, Dave is married to my oldest daughter, Deanna, and uh, Wesley's married to my youngest one, uh, Tracy. And they have two girls. And we only have the three grandkids, and we won't be having any more, but we have three of them. Three grandchildren? Mm-hmm. And son, uh, son has one boy who's... 23, and yeah, the girls... Yeah, grandson is 23. Wes and Tracy have two girls that are 10 and 12. 10 and 12, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I've had great support from my family through this whole mess. Uh, they, they've been all very good to me. The girls are fiercely loyal. Fierce. Yeah, Both wow. Of son, my son John, he just doesn't make a lot of sense, but yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now we've got some awful, awful good people. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, yeah. I if I was to die tomorrow, I'm a blessed man. Oh, very good. Yeah, I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm not rich in monetarily, but I sure am rich in friends. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, that's what's important. I'll have my retirement. We had over 300 people wow. at, a, at a farm out here. Uh, Big shop they have there, and we had three hundred for dinner. Wow, <laughs> a little over three hundred. Wow, that's so pretty, I've got a lot of that's good pretty wealthy me. right there. Oh yeah. yeah, I've got young guys that have worked for me out there at the plant who still to this day call me all the time. Yeah, I don't know how it's going. Sure missed working for you. <laughs> I treated them pretty fair, but wow. you know that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, as we uh, close down this, is there anything I didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Any of the stories that floated at the top that we've been sitting here uh, talking and, and jump in, uh, Gene, as well, if there's anything that you can think that he's left out? Or, or do you think, by and large, we've, we've capped off your story pretty good? Oh, pretty good. There's some combat things that happened that I probably haven't mentioned yet, but... Uh... Why don't you... Go through those pictures. Well, we'll, we'll do we'll do that yeah. after here. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, it was uh, 1968 was the fiercest fighting of the whole right. war. Yeah. Um, most amount of men killed. Um, I just happened to be one of the for fortunate ones that didn't. I came close on quite a few occasions. I hate to say I had mortar rounds landing within a few feet of me that. Uh, Picking up hot shrapnel off the ground and burn your hand. You know, that's how close it was on right at my feet. But they just didn't manage to kill me. <laughs> they tried there in the bunker. That thing <laughs> went off behind my head. But there happened to be a big post there that held the bunker up. And when it blew, right behind my head, it blew a hole this way. Oh, yeah. Of course, by that time, I was unconscious. But you can walk through that hole 
step right in the bunker. And uh, I was unconscious, of course, and they drug me out of there. But um, And a few other occasions that were very close. I had holes through my pants. <laughs> that didn't have, I was so damn skinny, they had to really be careful aimers to uh, hit me because I was pretty skinny in them days. I weighed about 130 pounds. As you'll see in some of these pictures, I yeah. wasn't not a strapping big boy. <laughs> but it was a, it was interesting, and I thought it was the honorable thing to do. Um, I still do. Um, and like I said, I, I would probably do it again. Mm. Right. I've heard this from John, and I've heard it from a lot of other guys that if if you if the country does go to war. They should let you win it. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. And that we've often said thing. that. Yeah. You know, I've lived through Vietnam, two of the big Thompson floods, which I was involved in both of those. One I lost the house in, and we managed to get the wife and kids up, but that was it. Um, and the second one I was trapped, trapped at, the, at, the, at the water treatment plant right. and managed to get out of there in four days. I was stuck in there for four days, but... <laughs> With yeah. Butch, no less. Yeah, I'm with my boy Butch. Yeah. I'd, if I was ever stuck in a bunker, that's where I'd, <laughs> I'd want him with me. He's a good man. And uh, things of that nature. But, uh, you know, I've seen plenty in my life that from death to babies. And it's, uh, I'm just thankful to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the last question I like to ask in these interviews, <clears throat> as you look back on your time in, in Vietnam, how, how did it or how did it change you, affect you, uh, change, play a role in your life? Or was it simply just a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer that? Well, it's funny because once I got out of the service, I still liked to keep my shoes shined, my gig line, you know, what they call the gig line. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, my uniforms are usually in, in the sheriff department. Always usually, usually right up to snuff. You know, I like to because it gave me a sense of pride that I never had before. Um, I still I like being the sergeant more than I like being the captain um, because sergeant fits my personality better. And it's like at the water treatment plant, I was the uh, chief plant operator there. So I had all the crews and all their schedules and all that kind of thing to take care of, but I had somebody else to answer to. And I kind of liked it that way the best. Uh, I was better sergeant than I was a officer. So uh, I, like, I like that aspect. Uh, things in our lives we've always we're really pretty generous and giving people. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and we actually love doing that. We really do. Yeah. Uh, we stop and help people on the side of the road. We give, we give away more than we ever get, that's for sure. But uh, nothing, which is nothing wrong with that. I like doing that. But uh, we're just generous. Uh, we've been the, the uh, um, Grand Marshals of the Corn Rose Parade. Through the Chamber of Commerce, who selected us for that, and I was flabbergasted beyond belief. But one of the things that it <coughs> has always struck me, and it had to do with John's Vietnam service, when the 1976 Big Thompson flood hit, it hit me hard, very hard. And John, it didn't. I I just sat down one day and said, "We lost our home, we lost our pets, everything." Why, it doesn't seem to affect you. And he said, I've lived through a lot worse. Yeah, right. And, and he talked about, Viet that's when he started talking more about Vietnam. Hmm. And, you know, it's... And uh, when we started giving back, saying, you know, he made it home from Vietnam alive. We made it out of the Thompson flood alive. There's got to be a reason God wants us to share what we have. And uh, those are things... And you can always replace things, but you can't replace your friend yeah. or your mm -hmm. family. You just can't replace those things. Yeah. 
Well, I so, was talking about when you found the body after um, the flood. One of the unfortunate ones found that fellow dead, and I knew who he was. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, it's unfortunate for him. We just happened to be some of the lucky ones, but a lot of them died, and you know, and we all got that to do. I'm glad that they didn't take me at that time, but uh, it's still uh, there's so much you can give yet. And it, it, it doesn't even phase your pocketbook, or all it does is make you a more enlightened person, you know? If you, it's, it, things are things, and it just doesn't matter. And it took me a long time to realize that, when I always thought, boy, the more stuff you had, the better off you were. Well, that's not necessarily true, even though I like my stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm a real tool addict. I, I've been in plumbing businesses and welding businesses and carpenters. And, you know, I'm, only, I'm real good with my hands, not so good with my head. You know? <laughs> the computers are a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the younger guys at the plant, you know, they all grew up in that uh, computer age where they're just whizzes that tell you how to fix your phone. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. So I'm uh, probably mostly old school type of thing, but uh, I admire them for their for their uh, ability to do that. I'd never been able to, but uh, uh, it, it's it's changed me a lot. Uh, come to know the, know the Lord a lot a lot more than I ever thought I would, and I will never deny him. Yeah. Never. I guess. Very good. Well, John, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but uh, just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our oh, country. It's, like I said, I'd do it again. Yeah. Very good. I would. Thank you. You're welcome. That is the day I left from for Vietnam in nine, January 1968 in North Plainfield, New Jersey. Uh... That is uh, back at the barracks in uh, Fort Eustace, Virginia, and the fellow sitting next to me is named George Washington. Hmm. Uh, jumping rope keeping in tip-top physical condition. <laughs> <laughs> First boat I ever drove on the James River in, uh, out of uh, Fort Eustace, Virginia. That is myself and Carl Feathers, a friend from New Jersey who I did not know was in Vietnam and accidentally ran into him while he was there. Is that him and I double dated in his car all the time. I didn't even know he had been drafted because I was already in. Yeah. And I accidentally ran into him uh, on a truck convoy, came into the base camp, was bringing in some food and stuff, and he was in it. And I couldn't believe it was him. <laughs> Uh, that's a picture of the dredge out on the main river, which they pumped all the sand and what have you into the base camp to build it. And it was later sunk by the BC. Uh, out there they blew it up and it sunk to the bottom of the river. That's uh, another picture of the dredge uh, before it was sunk, probably about three weeks later, 1968, in January, I believe it was. I'm um, holding an M2 carbine captured weapon uh, we took out of a bunker and I was just playing with it on deck. Now, would you ever go ashore or were you guys always... Uh... Oh, sometimes we did, yeah. but not too often. Mostly stayed on a boat. Okay. But that is uh, my dog, Lifer, that I bought from some local children for $5 before they ate him. <laughs> Now, would you have much interaction with the civilians at all? Um, some of them worked on the, on the base camp, you know, for laundry facilities and that kind of thing. But mm, only the ones you met out in the villages, out on the rivers, you know, you'd run into some. <clears throat> That's my homemade shower that I relocated all the plumbing from the officer's shower so we'd have one on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's my boat in the dry dock uh, after we bent the shaft and was having it replaced by the Navy at their repair facility there at Dongtan. Uh, just a picture of an M60 machine gun laying on the deck of the boat on the uh, catwalk. Yeah, you can really see it. Uh, that is a, a dock where the guy was sleeping behind that wall, got shot in the back with a shrapnel, uh, and that's the hole in the docket from a mortar round, probably around uh, March or April of 68. That's a picture of, his last name is Deardall. Lives in Minnesota, Great Falls, I think, or something like that, way up in Minnesota. Uh, I just caught him on the deck that day. We, He's all loaded up with helmet and flak jackets and stuff because we'd gotten hit, and I took his picture. It's, I don't remember his first name. Deardall is his last name. I, never, I thought it was a unique name. One of the 9th Infantry uh, soldiers being transported across the river in a local sampan. Infantry being hauled back to Dong Tam on my boat. Um, they had been out in the jungle for about three to four days and were ready to go back and get real food and a shower. That's a friend of mine, Robert Shaw from Sutton, West Virginia. Uh, that was just before we went to Vietnam, and then that's his uh, M16. We'd been out on the rifle range all day and took some pictures of him. Uh, that's in an area called Snoopy's Nose. On the map, that's what that area looked like on the river. And uh, that's an M60 machine gun, and uh, the... One's, the barrel stick in the air is a 50 caliber machine gun right behind me. Uh, and it was just a posed picture. Yeah. Ah, get out here, we'll take the picture. Okay. <laughs> That's a picture of David Steele, who was 17 years old. And when we went to Vietnam, he couldn't go because his mother wouldn't sign for him. And he argued with her, but she wasn't having any of it. And so he had to stay behind until... The following year, I believe he went, hmm. but uh, he couldn't go when he was 17. Huh. Uh, that's uh, me in the wheelhouse of the boat. Uh, I believe that was the 1-4 boat going up a canal and just snapped a picture. It says it on the back. Picture of me and Slick and Larry Briquette going up river. No shirts, hotter than heck. Uh, in for repairs after we were hit with a rocket on the side of the boat. Hmm. So, uh, just a day off in, in the base camp and just looking handsome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a Korean troop that came through to entertain us back at the base camp. Um, they were just there for one day. Hmm. And that was the first entertainment we'd ever had. <laughs> hmm. That is General Gus Pagonis, who was my captain in Vietnam, who ended up a three-star general. And you said played a very instrumental part in the Gulf War? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. He, he was in charge of all the logistics moved to uh, Saudi Arabia for the beginning of the first Gulf War. Hmm. John, tell me a little bit about this uh, beautiful uh, metals frame you've got here. Oh, okay. Um, those are some of the metals and ribbons and what have you. Down in this far corner over here is Expert Rifleman Badge, which I worked dearly to get to get a three-day pass. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I managed to pull it off. And then we had to qualify with other weapons, uh, M79 grenade launchers and uh, M60 and M50 uh, caliber machine guns. This is National Defense Ribbon, 9th Infantry Division Patch, same over here. These are unit citations with uh, olive branches on them. 
that we earned as a unit in Vietnam. We were cited twice for heroism under fire and that kind of thing. And then uh, this is just a pin with the river rats and a metal stamp of the Vietnam Wall. My dog tags and uh, American flag and the Vietnam Veterans of America patch. And all these were lost in the Big Thompson flood. But my uh, brother-in-law, who was still in the military at the time, got them all replaced for me, which I appreciate Bob Freelinger very much for doing that. I mean, Major Bob Freelinger. Hmm. Very good. This, this is a picture of the posse after we had done a movie for uh, the Sheriff Department. Um, I'm the guy with the purple or maroon colored handkerchief on. Um, right to uh, left, left to right is Jim Baker. Uh, knee, oops, kneeling is uh, Dave Jehu. Uh, one of our oldest. He's 84 years old and still qualifies. Is that right? He's a tough bird. Yeah. Uh, Dick Reagan, myself. Rex Manon, um, uh, Steve Maurer, I can't tell who that is from here. Um, this is Stan Martin on the end, um, and I, two other names escape me at the yeah. second, but um, anyways, uh, that was our movie we had made. Hmm. On horseback. <laughs> John? Yes. Uh, that is the Veterans Day Parade, with uh, which me and my son-in-law have led for the last five years. Uh, and my two daughters, my wife, and two of the grandchildren. Oh, very nice. 